Well, welcome everyone. Uh, glad everyone can, can join us today. Um, just a quick, uh, quick housekeeping note, uh, just to ensure that everyone uh, keeps themselves on mute. And if you need uh, any interpretation at the bottom of your um, Zoom uh, window, there is an interpretation button down there. Um, so all you have to do is click on it and select the language you wish to hear. Uh, so you have an option between French and English. Um, so you just have to uh, click, click on that interpretation button and you will be all set. Okay, um, so we are going to um, open this and I would like to, it's my, my pleasure to introduce uh, Ed Collins, uh, who is the manager of Indigenous Relations for NGLOBE. Uh, he is a, a lifelong citizen and resident of Fort William First Nation. Uh, Ed has graduated from a local high school within the city of Thunder Bay and then further enrolled uh, with uh, Confederation College. Ed started his career with his community as partner uh, property manager uh, with the uh, Anemke Mountain Corporation, uh, supervising over 150,000 square feet of commercial space. Uh, the success of Fort Williams land claim settlements allowed for bigger and better opportunities in economic development, and Ed sees this opportunity to broaden and strengthen his skills. With the position as economic development manager, it allowed him to represent Fort William First Nation in various industrial venues, uh, such as the Fort William First Nation Solar Park and expansion to the Bullwater Stud Mill Plant, located on the property owned by Fort William First Nation. Ed has sat on numerous boards in the past, such as Economic Development Committee, uh, City of Thunder Bay, uh, <laughs> Bam Squatta, uh, LLP, uh, the CEDC uh, Advisory Committee, University of Toronto Faculty of Law Advisory Committee, uh, President's Advisory Council on Economic Development for Lakehead University, uh, President of Supercom in Industries, and Ontario First Nations Economic Development Association. Uh, President, the Ontario Director, uh, Council for the Advancement of Native Development Officers, and on the Board of Governors uh, for Confederation College. In 2011, Ed received the designated professional level Aboriginal Economic Development Certification through the Council for Advancement of Native Development Officers. Ed is now the Manager of Indigenous Relations for NGLOBE, where he works to create proper, healthy, meaningful partnerships and working relationships with industry and the First Nations. He has created training programs within his industry, promoting and educating culture and issues of First Nations. Ed and his wife, Nancy, have two children and are proud to call Fort William First Nation their home. Miigwech. Uh, Ed, I give you the floor. Welcome. Miigwech, miigwech. Thank you, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to say um, bonjour, uh, Anin. Hello. Um, thank you for allowing me here. Uh, before we start, it's always important to um, do a small prayer. Uh, a lot of times I do a smudge, but uh, as, as we are on live, um, I can't do that. But these words of wisdom that I'm going to give you are were um, written by a very, um, who I think was a very important man in my life. Um, people may know him from TV shows, movies, but I had a chance to sit and talk to him as a child. His name was Chief Dan George. Yeah, very, um, if you ever get a chance, read some of his poems. But this is the one that I always uh, bring to the table whenever I go anywhere. I have a copy of it on my wallet as well. So I'd like to start this by saying these words of wisdom by him. Oh, great spirit, whose voice I hear in the winds. I come to you as one of your children. I need your strength and your wisdom. Make me strong, not to be superior to my brother, but to be able to fight my greatest enemy, myself. So, miigwech for that and that, miigwech for that. So once again, my name is Ed Collins. I'm the Manager of Indigenous Relations for uh, Anglo. 
in, in Thunder Bay. Um, I am a member of Foreign First Nation, as, as Connor explained. I am a, a pipe carrier for our First Nation. Pipe, pipe carrier is a very, is a very special um, gift to, to get. Um, I was gifted it many years ago from an elder. So no matter where we go, it's it's very important to acknowledge the lands. And I, I don't know where everybody is from here, but in Thunder Bay here, um, we acknowledge the lands. We are the traditional territory of the Robinson Spear Treaty. And the lands that which I sit on are the traditional territory of Fort First Nation. These are um, very important um, to acknowledge the lands because we are stewards of the land. We are here to protect them. And we heard to acknowledge that thank you, Miigwech, creator, for allowing us onto these lands. And as a me member of Fort First Nation, I want to say Miigwech to thank you for everybody out there. If you're if, if you're near, close, or on a reserve, I want to say Miigwech for myself for allowing me onto your lands in this way. So um, I sit here and, and I'm, I'm trying to ponder the relationship between our two cultures um, and our struggles in life. Um, I know from the past growing up in school, um, we only had a handful of, of Aboriginal students in our in our community, in our school, and a handful of Black as well. Um, we were treated different than all others, um, but the two of us were treated the same, if that makes sense. Um, I can't sit here and say what it feels to be uh, Black in, 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 in Canada or around the world. Um, but I could say what it feels like to be a First Nation Aboriginal. Again, you know, I, I don't even know what to call ourselves anymore. You know, one one year we're Aboriginal, one day we're Anishinaabe, one day we're uh, Indigenous. One, so I don't even know what to call us anymore, but I, I do know what I am. Um, however, uh, we do share the true meaning of family. Uh, we do tr the true meaning of our rich cultures. And, uh, that same uh, whooping from our gra grandmother or mums with the shoe if we get out of line. So we do share that as well. Um, I, could, I can say though, that we both have struggles still today, back then and still today, um, but we are both strong people and we will survive. So these are my openings. I wanna see Miigwech again. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Ed, um, for these words. Um, it's really beautiful. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. So my name is Radia, and I'm the uh, Global Partnership Coordinator for Africa and Climate Justice here at Kairos. Um, it is really great to see so many faces today. I think it really speaks volume to the work we're trying to do here. Um, I also want to thank our amazing panelists for sharing their lives, their stories, and their experiences with us today. Um, it is a very special day. Um, this is Carol's first Black History Month. And uh, we want to acknowledge the support of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation in making this event possible, uh, thanks to its National Anti-Racism Fund, which supports organizations to combat racism, promote events and education, and build a more um, anti-racist society. So with the theme of Black History Month being Black Resistance this year, we wanted to highlight ways that Black and Indigenous activists and communities, as well as people of Afro descent and from the diaspora have expressed and celebrated resistance in the past, the present, and what it means for the future. And we really hope that this round table generates discussions on how we can all together and globally advance the work of anti-racism, anti-Black racism. Anti -black racism. Um, so we hope to have a very rich discussion. And if you have any questions during the event, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll collect them um, for the speakers at the end of the event. Um, we are also very grateful uh, to have with us today um, Adele Halliday, um, who will be moderating this panel discussion. Um, Adele is the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. Um, she's an experienced anti-racism educator, workshop leader, and award-winning writer. Adele has been involved in anti-racism work with the churches in Canada and beyond for many years. She's currently staff resource to the United Church Anti-Racism Common Table and has been the moderator for the World Council of Churches Advisory Group on Overcoming Racism, Racial Discrimination and Xenophobia. And she holds a Master of Education as well as a Master of Theological Studies. She's currently studying towards a Doctor of Education. So thank you again very much Adele for being with us today and over to you. 
And thank you, Radia, for the introduction and welcome everyone to today's uh, panel conversation uh, on, um, on voices of resistance. It's really good that you are here. Um, so I'll be moderating today's panel discussion. So I'm going to introduce our panelists who um, have some exciting conversations in, uh, lined up for us today. And uh, as we go, as noted, please feel free to add your questions into the chat and um, we will weave those into the, into the conversation. Um, the format for today's panel discussion will be that we will explore um, three different themes and each theme has a question that each panelist will respond to. Um, and so we'll hear from um, all of our panelists and then we'll hear some spoken word and some poetry. It's going to be a fantastic gathering. So our first question today um, under the first theme is what has resistance looked like in the past for your community? And I'm gonna invite each of our panelists to share uh, responses to those. Um, I'll introduce the panelists one by one as they begin to, as they begin to speak. Um, so the question again is, what has resistance looked like in the past for your community? And the invitation for the panelists will be to share a story from your community that shows the impact of colonization on community and land or that shows the resistance of your people. So we'll hear from all of our panelists. The first person we'll hear from is Ed, and Ed was introduced previously. So um, we'll look forward to hearing from you, Ed. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm kind of shocked those first, but uh, <laughs> we'll go with it. Um, so for our community, again, I want to say, uh, you know, I understand it's Black History Month, and uh, June is um, Aboriginal History Month. And I think it's very important that we acknowledge that you know the contributions of Black people in Canada and around the world, you know, made to made to this amazing continent. So, uh, so I'll go to the question here. So, four First Nations have been involved in three huge major land claim settlements of lands that were taken, expropriated lands that were taken. Uh, one was taken from by the military, used for a, a rifle range. Uh, one of our one of the other one was the, one of the largest land claims in Canada, where they expropriated um, many, many, many acres of land uh, just through the city of Thunder Bay, up through um, Kekabeka Falls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we were pushed into these lands uh, and moved over to a mountainish, swampish area um, on the First Nation. Um, Many of these, where we were before, we had even a cemetery. The cemetery was um, dug up, and these bodies were moved over to uh, what is known as Foreign First Nation today. Um, sadly, um, they weren't prepared for for these bodies to be moved, and, and for weeks and months, these um, coffins were tossed to the sides of the road and bodies kind of lay on the side until they decide where they want to put it and finally did it. These are things that that, that um, our community and communities go through and went through in the past. But, um, you know, we're, we're a strong, resilient people and um, we overcome many, many issues. Um, so, so that's, that's my thing. Okay. Thank you, Ed, and thanks for reminding us of uh, being a strong and resilient people. So thank you for that, Ed. Uh, the next panelist we'll hear from is Ruva, and I'll introduce Ruva. This is Ruva Wekarere. Um, so Ruva is a Black activist whose work is rooted in faith-based social justice. She has an academic background in women's gender and sexuality studies and political science. She has been a grassroots activist and organizer for over a decade, as well as worked in policy with a vision towards liberation. She's passionate about the intersections of oppression and how they can serve as a basis for solidarity among marginalized communities. She has served as a community relations officer for Black Lives Matter Sudbury, where she built a community solidarity coalition. And she's currently the Justice, Peace, and Integrity Co of Creation Coordinator for the Congregation de Notre Dame Visitation Province. So welcome, Ruva. Uh, we are glad you're here. And I will ask you the same question. 
So what has resistance looked like in the past for your community? Thank you so much, Adele. Uh, yeah, so I, um, giving it a little bit of history. So I am from Zimbabwe and um, that's where I, I grew up and was born. Um, and that's where my um, kind of community's history of resistance begins. Um, so Zimbabwe was for a long time a colony of Britain um, and then uh, once it was it became an independent country it was still very much run uh in, within its government by uh those white settler colonialists who had moved there and um in the 60s there was a war of independence that ended up that was able to free that and uh create uh there was a, like it was a grassroots kind of guerrilla warfare war of independence that created um, an independent nation of Zimbabwe and that happened even during my parents lifetime and that is a story of resistance that has brought me to where I am today and I always think that that historical context is important for who I've become um, and so as I carried that and um, really internalized it into my own into my own activism. Um, I became an activist starting pretty early on. And most most recently, I've worked with Black Lives Matter Sudbury for a number of years, beginning in 2020, um, where we built a movement for uh, Black liberation in Northern Ontario, um, in communities that I think often people don't think about as having Black history, but they have for decades. Um, and for us, that resistance has been through art very often. Um, so we have been able to create murals and arts programs for youth and an actual Black arts festival for the first time in Northern Ontario this past year, um, as well as doing every year a um, an educational Black History Month virtual museum and a conference. Um, and these actions, in at including these actions plus um, protests that we did throughout the years, highlighting issues of um, police violence and other issues that really affected the Black community in Sudbury, but in North America as a whole, um, have really showed the, the need for this kind of activism and this kind of resistance. And our resistance really centers around Black joy, because for us, it is both about you know, informing ourselves and our greater communities about Black history, specifically in Northern Ontario for us in those instances, because that's where we are based, um, but in Canada in general, but also connecting those struggles, you know, as like, similar to my story that I told is those, all of the struggles, I think, of the Black diaspora are really connected, and that shows in our activism when we center art and, and culture and Black joy, and that's, I think, the, the locus for me of where where the that activism comes from and where that resistance has come from um and um like Adele said that led to creating a solidarity movement within uh, Greater Sudbury of many different social issues so from housing and poverty and climate activism together with Black Lives Matter um, we were able to organize around elections in the past year and for me I think that is the core of resistance and Black resistance is that it, it does like center around the issues that affect us the community but we are always stronger when we work in solidarity and when we work at as many different peoples together which is why i think that is that's one of the major parts of this uh not only past resistance but the future of resistance movements for us thank you thank you ruva thank you for grounding us in your history um the history of uh, a reminder of, of uh, zimbabwean roots and the struggle for independence and how the past connects to the present, your current activism through art and Black joy um, and solidarity movements. So thank you very much for that. Um, just a reminder for everyone who's here that if you have questions, please feel free to add them to the chat at any time and we will add, um, feed those to the panelists. Uh, our next panel speaker, it will be Patrick. Uh, this is Patrick Cabea.
And Patrick was born in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And uh, Patrick is a Congolese Canadian award-winning documentary producer who is currently based in Ottawa, Ottawa, Canada. With his films, Patrick has earned a reputation for creating stories, which mainly focuses on Congolese political and sorry, Congolese colonial and political history and pan-African historical figures. His six short documentary films and two full-length features have screened collectively in over 40 festivals across the globe, including one Audience Choice Award for Congo, a political tragedy, and also getting nominated for the UNESCO Flemish Commission African Documentary of 2020 for his latest film, From Patrice to Lumumba. In 2021, he mentored the inaugural BIPOC, so Black Indigenous People of Color Creator Program with the Digit Digity uh, 60 Festival. And he also worked as a line producer for the Being Black in Canada series in the Ottawa cohort between 2021 and 2022. In the future, Patrick plans to write and produce a Pan-African history series, which will aim to highlight Pan-African leaders such as Thomas Sankarera, Steve Biko, and more. So welcome, Patrick. We're delighted we're here and you're here and we'll ask you the same question that we're asking so far, which is what has resistance looked like in the past for your community? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the invitation to be here and uh, all that. I was listening to you talk about my bio. I'm like, no, that's not me. So thanks so much, actually. I really, really appreciate that. Um, colonization took a lot from um from our people, actually. And um there's a lot of there's a lot of ways today that we're resisting. And re resistance comes in a lot of uh, a lot of form. And today I actually want to focus on something small, uh, which a lot of people might actually understand in terms of how our people, our communities across the Western world basically is fighting back, and that's hair. Right. Uh, and the workplace has always uh, expected us to westernize our, our hair, to have it a specific way. And that's been to the detriment of our health, physically and mentally, uh, physically in terms of the chemicals that we've had to put in and stuff like this. And we complied for a long time. And that's the effect of colonization. We complied for a long time, uh, whether it was here in, uh, in the Western world or in, in our lands in Africa. And for a lot of Africans, they'll tell you that. We grew up where they will tell us to cut our hair a specific way. You had to look a specific, proper Western way, ways. And uh, But now there's a pushback, I find. Um, and you see that a lot, a pushback to reclaim and be proud of our natural hair. And I find that as a resistance, you know, with uh, with movements across the Western world of Black people, of all gender, always just uh, unapologetically embracing their natural hair so i think that's a small meaningful uh small but it's uh it's a meaningful um uh resistance currently taking place uh within our communities so yeah so just uh for small something as small as hair can also shows how it's empowering us to reclaim the narrative that they told us that only straight hair was beautiful or or you had to do this or you had to uh, bleach your skin or stuff like that so i'm starting to realize that there's a lot of reclaiming and we are unapologetically doing it and just saying that you know what this is who we are take us accept us as we are whether i have my braids or my nappy hair this is who I am and uh, you will accept me at the same table as you so i think uh i'm very happy to see the resistance happening in our communities right now on something as um, maybe meaningless or whatever, but it's something as small as hair. That's it. That's great. Thanks, Patrick, for reminding us of hair and the resistance that can happen through hair and reclaiming yeah, the conversation about nappy hair. <laughs> I love it. So that's great. So thank you very much for that, Patrick. Um, the last panelist we'll hear for this theme, uh, this particular theme question is oh, Joanne, Joanne Rachel, um, who is the advocacy coordinator for the South Sudan Council of Churches. Uh, and the South Sudan Council of Churches is a long-term ecumenical and Kairos partner in South Sudan. 
Um, it is a Women of Courage partner in the Women, Peace and Security program and an active partner in the Gender, Conflict and Climate program. And Rachel works to analyze peace processes, in particular the revitalized agreement on the resolution of conflict in South Sudan, while also informing policies and decision making of the church and the government. She is engaged in contextualizing and implementing the Women, Peace and Security agenda in South Sudan and the Great Lakes region of Africa, and continues to advocate for the inclusion of women and youth in peace building, governance and climate change. So welcome, Joanne, welcome, uh, Rachel. Rachel, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. I don't know <clears throat> if you can if you can see me and hear me. Uh, sorry, my room is a bit dark. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's about how we resist colonization and how decolonization is happening. Um, liberation movements in my country, um, we've been fighting a number of people, the British, the Egyptians and the Arabs. So it has been really hard for us to fight all these people and you can see the mix of cultures, but we're doing this through naming our children with our African names. And we want to go, do away with um, foreign names that um, to confuse us and make us feel like our names uh, do not have meaning or do not have value. So through naming our children with African names, we are resisting the colonization. We're also changing the language we use towards each other. Um, you know, um, the language that time with the colonialists, they would say you're less than, you're a slave. If you have a black skin, you're a slave. So we've changed that language that we use towards one another. And we also have free movement through borders. You know, with colonization came um, separation through boundaries and borders. So having free movement towards each other, so that we remember that we are brothers and sisters is a way that we are resisting colonization. I'd like to share some words from someone called Ijoma. Um, she's a poet. Um, just a few words. She says, I lost cultures. I lost a whole language. I lost it all in the fire that is colonization. So I will not apologize for owning every piece of me. They could not take, break or claim as theirs. So the fight still continues. Our minds are washed um, with a lot of information that is not true, but we're still trying to fight by making sure that our cultures are still existent. So that's what I can say about how we're resisting. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for reminding us of the importance of resistance through names and language and freedom of movement. Um, so, so far we've heard from four speakers, four panelists, um, Ed, Ruva, Patrick, and Rachel, responding to the question of what has resistance looked like in the past for your community? And we've heard of um, the kind of naming of being a strong and resilient people. We've heard of the importance of resistance through hair, resisting through art and culture, resisting through names and language and freedom of movement um, as some examples of the way in which people are, are resisting uh, in their own communities and own contexts. So thank you all of you for, for that. Uh, we will next hear um, spoken word. And sp this spoken word is going to be offered by Devisha Francis. Uh, so please allow me to introduce Devisha and then she will offer her spoken word. So Devisha Francis is 22 and is passionate about neuroscience and linguistics. She is committed to use her voice to lift up others, address systemic injustices and spread love. Devisha underwent her studies in England, which ignited her love for travel. Her love for community shows up in her volunteer roles as the chair of the St. Andrews United Church's Transition Committee and as the communications director for Mirror Appel. Devisha also works as a contingent labor analyst at a global consulting firm. And you are welcome to explore more of her spoken word at Devisha underscore speaks on Instagram. So welcome Devisha. Hello, thank you Adele for the intro. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I will be sharing a poem called So I Ask You and I'll just go ahead and jump right in. I wonder why you shoot first and ask questions later. 
why you avoid questions and don't assume any blame, why you shoot to kill when you could stop them with one bullet. Two, if you're really scared. Three, if you're just a racist who doesn't care. How am I not supposed to react when there's a gun in my face, but you choose to shoot the black flesh of people who just want to live today? How dare you? Go home to your families unharmed, unashamed, when you brought another member of our resilient community down for what? Personal gain, there are only so many bullets our bodies can take before we scatter the streets, but you won't even let us protest in peace. Isn't it horrible? that I hope my children don't come out too dark skinned. Isn't it sad that I cry for people I never once met? Isn't it devastating? That I can turn off the news when I'm too overwhelmed, when my tears have dried and my head aches while mothers, wives, children, brothers, sisters, friends, and communities waited hours for a man who wasn't coming home, who you took from their home. I'm sure their throats burn when they think of your face and your brutality as the last thing he saw in his gaze. And I don't think it's enough that you have to live with what you've done because there is not enough remorse in your eyes to convince me you don't believe you haven't already won 2005. 3.5 million guns in America alone, not including corrupt cops or unregistered weapons, 2006. 10,177 gun-related deaths, believing poor firearm control doesn't increase fatal violence as such a myth, 2007. 90 firearms per 100 people, revolvers, shotguns, rifles, 270 million guns and millions of lives to follow. I'm dangerous because I'm black. And you're dangerous because of the badge on your chest or simply the whiteness of your flesh. But one of us gets to shoot, kill, and walk away free, and the other is left to bleed. I'm, you always aim to kill us. We are trained to do and say the right things and still you want to kill us. We are allowed to live and be free and happy and for that you want to kill us. Who gave you the right to steal someone else's life when your life is surely not more valuable than mine? I've seen, felt, and experienced more in my 22 years than you have in your whole life, yet you continue to disregard all of my reasons to live. So I ask you, officer, white man, white woman, if you were me, you stand staring down the barrel of my gun if I shot to kill with no remorse. Though you were not guilty, unarmed, maybe a little frustrated and a lot bit scared, would you still not care? When your mother cries out in pain, when your children grow up with one less parent, when your community is looking for the one to blame, wouldn't it break your heart that I could get away with everything under the sun, even murder, because I'm black or simply because I wore a badge on my chest, sleeve or shoulder? Thank you. Thank you, Navisha, for that powerful spoken word. I wonder if we might just have a moment of silence so we can absorb all that was named. Thank you once again, Devisha, for that powerful sharing. Um, friends, we are going to continue uh, with our panel conversation. Um, we've explored one theme so far. What has resistance looked like in the past for your community and heard from our four panel speaker, our panel speakers. Uh, the next question that we are going to explore is what does resistance look like for you in your work? And I mean, more specifically, we, we, we have a sense that colonization and its impacts continue in our time. So the invitation for the panelists is to explore, well, how do you and your community decolonize? Um, what mediums do you use? How do you resist? So again, we'll hear from each of our four panelists. They've already been introduced, so we won't introduce them once again. We'll just um, move into the, the questions for the conversation. So uh, Rachel, we're wondering if we can hear from you first, please, around what does resistance look like for you in your work. Okay, um, as Steve Biko said, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So we have been oppressed through our minds and we still feel like we are less than as black people or African people, people 
Unfortunately, Rachel uh, is having some technical difficulties. Uh, the internet is, is coming in and out. So we'll come back to Rachel in a moment. Um, hopefully the internet will be reconnected so that we can hear uh, her insights. Uh, in the meantime, um, let's move to Ruva um, to hear from Ruva um, responding to that same question. We'll come back to Rachel later on. Um, but Ruva, the question again is, what does resistance look like for you in your work? Thank you so much. Um, I think resistance in my work has, for me, um, really been highlighted um, by the idea that it's not only the work itself, but it's how that work is done. Um, I think that's really resonated with me. Um, and I think especially having done activism and organizing and working in nonprofits, um, something that can very much permeate how we work is an idea of scarcity. And I think for me, that has been a really uh, a liberating factor has been trying to move beyond that. Um, because I think most of us here can probably um, identify with the idea of feeling like there, there isn't enough, you know, there isn't enough funding or time or people to get the things done that we need to do. Um, and I think having starting to work from a place of abundance of not thinking, you know, there isn't enough, but thinking how can we share, reshare what is there so that there is enough. It's really helped me to work. It's helped me to slow down and reflect on the work that I do, which I think is so vital in this work, um, but it's also helped me to widen what I think is possible um, to make the scope smaller sometimes of what I am doing um, by bringing in community, uh, by asking for help, by working more in solidarity. Um, because I think when we think, oh, I am the one who has to do this resistance work and I'm the one who has to dismantle these structures by myself, um, it becomes an impossible task. And I think very much the way to decolonize and liberate that mindset is to understand it as there is enough, you know, like that this work, the work of justice will happen and that there is enough to make it happen. So changing the question from, you know, how do we how do we get more resources or how do we figure out how to work these little resources say how do we reshare and make sure that there is enough to get done what needs to happen but also let go of some of the ways of working that aren't working you know because they because they exclude people or because they're inaccessible um so that we can bring everyone along within our movement um, and those things I think have been lessons that I've learned that I've really kept with me in terms of ensuring that um, that my work is able to to decolonize um, and that it's able to be resistant not only in its in its impact but in how I'm doing that work every day um, and that's changed not only I think the outcomes of my work, I think the outcomes have been a lot stronger. I think we've been able to do a lot more, but also it's changed uh, how I feel and how I'm able to do that work because I know burnout, especially for marginalized people, for so many people and especially for marginalized people, it's so easy to burn out on this work. Um, and that expansiveness has really helped me to find rest and uh, solidarity in those I'm working with. Thank you. Thank you, Ruva, and thanks for the reminder to reframe the question. It's about how we go about the work, challenging notions of scarcity, of scarcity and working with abundance, and that there is enough to do the work of justice. So thank you very much for that, Ruva. Um, so we'll go back to Rachel to hear a few more of her insights. Um, we were able to hear a little bit around the decolonizing the mind. Um, so let's go back to Rachel and uh, hear more of her responses to what does resistance look like for, for her in, in her work. So Rachel, welcome back, please. Okay, um, I won't put the video on. I think it's uh, one of the things that's making me go off. Um, so I was sharing about the education of the mind and having peer to peer conversations with uh, young people about our cultures. And then second is documentation of our oral history. You know, um, the white people came and decided that they have discovered certain things because they saw them. 
So, and they consider the oral history as not history because it's not written. So being able to document the things that our parents or the parents of our parents tell us is something very powerful. And I do that and I encourage the other young people to do that. When we go for conflict resolution, we listen to them on how they locally um, resolve conflicts. I think that's a way of resisting colonization. And also in my work, I advocate for museums. So we preserve the work of our ancestors. We have to make sure that those that come after us can see what happened, what, how can we solve issues? How did those that came before us do this? So I think that's very important. And doing this every day and advocating for it every day brings me so much joy. And in a way, it reminds my brothers and sisters that we did not start with slavery, as I mentioned before. We had a rich history that was not written. And if we document it, then at least we will see it. And then those that come after us will see it. So that's how I do it. And it brings me so much joy and I'm happy to share with everyone else. Thank you for sharing, Rachel. And we're so glad we could hear your insights, uh, reminding us about the importance of decolonizing the mind and uh, documenting oral histories and education and, and the preservation of that in, in museums so that generations that come uh, afterwards can also uh, know what has happened. So thank you. Uh, next on our panel, we will hear from Ed. Um, and Ed is again responding to the same question. What does resistance look like for you in your work? Um, and an invitation for anyone, if you have any questions, please feel free to add them to the chat at any time. So Ed, we are looking forward to hearing from you. All right, so um, first I gotta just to remember that, um, that, well, First Nations create their own rules uh, and their own laws as they are a separate nation from Canada, basically. Um, and, you know, we've created powwows, we've got back to powwows, et cetera. But you have to remember back in 1921, um, Canada created a rule that First Nations were not allowed uh, to gather either for feasts, for dancing, and they um, permitted us not to, uh, well, not to, not to do these things. Um, 1885, they permitted, they, they created the past system that uh, not allowed us to leave our First Nations. That we were stuck in our First Nations, and we couldn't we couldn't leave without without the federal government's permission or the Indian agent's permission. And um, as well, you got to remember, 1950s um, for five dollars, you too could you too could own your own native boy or native girl. So for five bucks, a lot of people bought First Nation people, and we lost that culture. We lost uh, our rights. We lost our language. Um, it's funny somebody talked about hair kind of earlier, uh, but uh, as you can tell, I have none. Um, but that defines what Native people are, and it's kind of sad. Uh, I hear this. I heard this at a at a job that I recently had, where I was the quote whitest Indian he's ever known because I don't have the long hair. I don't speak like you know the Native people that are out there. I guess. Um, I don't fish, I don't hunt. So that's, I guess that creates who I am and it's kind of, you know, the hair kind of thing. So I want to bring back that. Um, but, you know, we are, we lost our culture, we lost our rights, but we're slowly moving forward and uh, getting those, the, that culture, that education back. Um, you know, um, United Nations created the um, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, the first person to sign that declaration of United Nations was Barack Obama in the United States. The last person that, that signed that was Canada. So that shows you how far back we still are as a, as a nation or as, 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 as Canada that, that, um, that we need to you know, learn from our mistakes kind of thing. Um, they have even created the truth, uh, truth and reconciliation. We all know, uh, we all know about the, um, residential schools and, and we won't get into that too much but um, you know we got calls to action and number 92 of that is trying to convince corporate um, corporate Canada to um, have stuff like this right and that's where I come into place we talk about uh, um, what my workplace looks like they've hired 
a First Nation, an Aboriginal, an Indigenous, a Native Anishinaabek person to do a Native Anishinaabek Aboriginal job. So my job is to create that 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 culture that and to explain to people who we are, what we do, kind of thing, right? So so when you when you go into communities, you understand what a smudge is. You understand uh, how to how to uh, approach an elder. You know, I hold right now. I, nobody could see this, but I hold my 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 um, tobacco in my hand as we speak. Um, tobacco is a strong medicine for the First Nations, and we give that to we give that to our elders and to chiefs and people we talk to. Um, so in work, um, I see it's, I see it's, 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 it's uh, um, starting to get a little better. I see that, that they hired, like I said, I hired a First Nation person to do a First Nation job and people are actually listening. You know, I have my smudge bowl in my office. I have my, my, my door open to any interpretations or any questions. So, so I think, um, it's slowly starting to change and that's what I see at work. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Ed, for reminding us again of history of um, past systems of not being allowed to gather and the slow but steady change and recognizing that we still have a very long way to go. So thank you for that, Ed. Um, the last speaker we'll hear for on this section of the panel um, is Patrick. So Patrick, uh, over to you, please, for responding to the question, what does resistance look like for you in your work? Thank you, thank you. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to Rachel for evoking uh, Steve Bantubiko. He is one of my uh, African resistance movement hero, if you want to put it that way. And uh, so uh, thank you for that. It was, it was great to hear his name. And as, uh, as Patrice Lumumba also said, uh, uh, in his final letter before he was killed, he wrote a letter to his wife. And in it, he had two lines, which I really love. One of the lines says, um, history will have its say. And then the, uh, about two lines later, he says, Africa will write its own history. And in French, it says, l'Afrique écrira sa propre histoire. So Africa will write its own history. And uh, due to colonization, the humanity of Black people or African people is, is, you know, it's always been hidden behind stereotypes, um, myth, and all these bad things, you know, like, for example, from the Congo, one of the first books written about the Congo, the heart of the dark, uh, heart of darkness, Right, it's just this this bad place where white people shouldn't venture in because you know there's cannibalism and stuff like that. So black voices have always been silenced, um, only allowed to, I guess, talk to like again, like Rachel said, uh, talk by when it's validated by an expert or like the Westerners. Um, it was like politicians, like in 1885. It's interesting. Ed brought up 1885. In 1885, in Africa, that's the year which is called. Um, Berlin conference or the carving of Africa, right? So, so you had expert like politicians, bureaucrat, and priests around the, the Western world who were telling our stories or who had this bad narrative of who we were. So, I think resistance for me in my work is telling our story, telling our story and representing our history and culture with respect, with understanding, with dignity, and giving our voices its humanity back. Uh, I work a lot with, uh, with with black actors and creators uh, in the community, and we all work toward one common goal, and that common goal is resistance. Uh, so basically, res resistance for us to tell our own stories, uh, which we've been erased from from history. So for me, I think it's it's as artists and as filmmakers and community leaders, I feel that we kind of have an, uh, to understand that we have potential for political activism in our work. So um, in my work, what I try to do is to defend our heritage, our culture, uh, our traditional rights, speaking of our history, so that we can unapologetically tell our stories and be true to, to, to history so that future generation will be part of our history. So really resistance for me, just telling our stories in, like Patrice Lumumba said, Africa will one day have it say. So it's just the more we tell our stories, we resist, we we break those stereotypes that were created 
by experts who um, don't know our culture. Again, like Rachel mentioned, like um, our story didn't start in 1885 or in 1462 when the Portuguese uh, first got to the continent. It started before that. We have, we know, we had amazing kingdoms and stuff. I guess all of Africa, the, the great kingdom of the Congo, of Zimbabwe. And so I think, I think if we write those stories, if we reclaim that, um, that's my way of uh, fighting this is just by writing our stories, telling people that we also are people with, you know, with humanity. And um, yeah, that's the way I'm um, trying to fight that so that we, uh, the future generation can be proud of our stories and also see themselves with, um, yeah, with practice and just say, you know what, this is, our people did this or our people did that too. And forget the narrative that were written by the Europeans or anybody else that's never been there. We're not the heart of darkness. We are actually a place of a lot of um, yeah, kings and queens and stuff like that, which actually had been there for, for, for centuries and stuff and uh, for millennia, actually. So um, just be proud of, our, of, of writing our stories. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, again, for lifting up the names of Steve Biko and Patrick Lumumba and reminding us of the importance of telling our stories and uh, challenging the notion of the Black voice being being silenced and the creative ways that you're doing that through filmmaking. So thank you very much. Um, so we've heard from our four speakers so far um, around this question of uh, what does resistance look like for you in your own work. Uh, we're going to cycle back to each of the panelists um, with a couple follow-up questions. So one question for everyone um, is going to be, what is the impact of resistance on youth in the community? So in a moment, we'll hear from everyone around that question, around specifically around youth. Um, and then we'll also hear just a follow-up question for everyone um, to uh, just go a little deeper into some of the work and a little bit of the sharing that they've talked about. Um, so we'll go in reverse order. This time we'll hear from Patrick first. So Patrick, we'd love to hear from you around that first question. Uh, what is the impact of resistance on youth in the community? Um, and a follow-up question, specifically because you talked a lot about storytelling um, and you have an amazing outlet for that as a filmmaker. For people who are not filmmakers, um, what would you name for people in terms of ways in which they can continue to tell their own stories um, or challenge the notion of Black voices being silenced? So some thoughts around both of those, please. The first one, actually, it's interesting uh, uh, you bring this question. Uh, it's funny, just this past weekend, I was on the panel uh, with Black actors, and uh, and we we're asking how they're challenging, or what are they doing to change stuff? And one thing I realized, and they were all saying they're unapologetically not taking um, stereotypical, uh, stereo stereotypical casted uh, roles anymore, right? And this is how black actors are fighting in 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 my industry i guess in in filmmaking for example they're saying no i came here to play macbeth i don't want to play the cook right so i think they realize that you know what this this could be detriment to my portfolio but i'll i'll stick with it and and fight this uh stereotypes and stuff so i see a lot of people refusing to play those roles because of what they're starting to see around them that a black person can also be a lead actor a black person can also be the um for example the last thing i was working on um it was done by a, a black woman um black cast first black show uh created in ottawa and there was so much prideness in that where we seeing roles now of people that we know we know black doctors we know black lawyers and stuff like that and we don't have to just be the the typecast so i think that the youth in the community are starting to understand that they don't have to play that game anymore and uh, so it's funny for me i'm in my early 40s so working with people in their 20s seeing that for some of us we had to play the game right we had to play the game to to fit in or to get another gig or to to be called again where they're like you know what i don't want to play this game i'm not here for this i went to film school so respect me as an equal and respect me as a peer so that's that's what i love seeing from the youth right now and i'm 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 in awe of them actually so that's uh that's beautiful to see um the second question do you mind uh just saying it again uh 
Yes, absolutely. It's the the question is around um, uh, telling our stories, and uh, you you have a very creative outlet around that as a filmmaker. So, for people who are not filmmakers, what are some ways in which they might be able to tell stories or challenge the notion of black voices being silenced and so on? Uh, before, thank you again for that. Uh, before telling our stories, we need to learn about our, our stories, right? There's a, a whole knowing where we go, we've we gone, we have to know where we're from. So you don't have to be a filmmaker, you don't have to be a writer or a poet or a spoken word person to, to tell our stories. You just have to be, educate yourself on who we are, right? Um, we have like people like Kim Pavita, who was like the African, for example, um, Joan of Arc. She was 16 years old and fought the Portuguese uh, Catholic uh, uh priest and stuff like that like that we're doing whatever they were doing so like we have those stories where you it doesn't have to come out as a film it can just be as a conversation at a at a luncheon with your friends you know um i remember one day somebody told me oh patrick you know um tomorrow it was uh it was november 11th november 10th and they said to me tomorrow you you must be happy because it's a day off your people, and this, yes, this is a, 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 a peer of mine told me, your people won't, your people didn't fight uh, the war. And I was like, oh, that hurts. Because you know what? My people fought for the Belgian colonial troops, right? So I didn't have to make a film about it. I just have to know about it and educate that person right there and there. So I think youth have to, we have to go back to the, to the library and learn about our, our history, whether it's um, the Nigerian history, the Congolese history, um, it doesn't matter what, uh, like just the collective black history, the Atlantic trade, uh, slave trade, the fact that there was, um, there was this black Canadian history in Canada, right? All those, we have to learn it. Somebody again once told me, Patrick, yeah, you're Canadian, but your ancestors didn't build Canada like my ancestors. And she was from, I think her background was Scottish. And and I didn't know about Black Canada at, at that point. And I shrink because my Black ancestors didn't build Canada. But then years later, I learned a lot about Black Canada. I'm like, oh man, I wish I could have that conversation back so I could actually tell her about what I've learned. But I think we just have to educate ourselves. There's nothing else. Uh, you don't have to be a filmmaker, a writer. You just, just educate yourself that way. What That way you can defend our culture correctly, exactly. So in the, I just saw Black Nova Scotian history. Absolutely, we need to educate ourselves on those things so that we can proudly talk about it. We can proudly put our hand and say, yes, my ancestors as the Kabeas from the Congo didn't build the Congo, uh, didn't build uh, Canada. But you know what? Black, uh, my Black ancestry in Canada did build Canada. So, uh, and today we see it in stuff like um, the CBC show Porters, where we start to realize that Canadian Black people have been part of this history so Canadian black uh, history is Canadian history so let's not forget that and let's uh let's be proud of it and uh we don't have to make movies about it fantastic thank you Patrick thank no you problem. for sharing both about uh, uh youth resistance and also this broader question and uh finding results of history education and more so thank you again uh, next, we'll hear from Ed. So we're all responding to this question, this first question around what is the impact of resistance on youth in the community? So we'll hear from you, Ed, around that. And a follow-up question um, specific to some of the things that you were talking about. Uh, I mean, you talked about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and specifically calls uh, the call to action number 93. Um, and, you know, we talked about the importance of, of Canada learning from its mistakes and, um, and your own role as an Indigenous person working in Indigenous organizations. So the follow up question is, um, what would you say uh, around uh, to, for non Indigenous peoples around their own learning and, um, and challenging and being in solidarity? So, uh, so those are the two questions, the first one around youth resistance and the second one, what's your message to non Indigenous peoples? All right. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, first, we'll step back a little bit here. So, growing up, uh, my well, my mother, my mother and my father went both went to day school. Uh, it was residential schools, basically. Um, my mom would get beaten if she spoke spoke her language. So, uh, when we were growing up, um, we never spoke the language because she was afraid that when we went to school, we would get beaten up by by the priests and nuns as well. So we never understood and we never did our culture. We never did a lot of stuff, Indian stuff kind of thing, right? Um, 
but now what's happening is our youth are starting to um, understand that culture. They're, under, they're starting to get into the beating, into the powwows. Um, they're starting to uh, open their eyes to the language, to the culture. You know, right behind me, in my, even in my, my, um, um, my picture here, I have a smudge bowl and a smudge in, in our traditional um, medicines. Um, our, our youth are starting to open their eyes and get into that and start to, um, starting to get back to that culture. So, um, you know, with films like uh, Indian Horse, um, we were we were children, and even books like uh, Seven Fallen Feathers that was created about the, the seven uh, Aboriginal youth that were killed here in Thunder Bay. Um, these are opening the eyes to a lot of youth, and they're starting to uh, understand that that the culture um, has to come back. That we have to start. Uh, listening to our elders, we have to start uh, understanding the, the seven uh, grandfather teachings of our, of our past. And I think slowly our youth are starting to get into that. And um, second question, sorry. <laughs> Great, thank, thank you, Ed. Uh, if, if, there's a, if there's something that you would like to say to uh, non-Indigenous peoples around learning or resistance. Yeah. Okay, um, you know, I always say, you know, uh, my, my jokingly, my wigwam's always open, you know, it's as simple as just a simple talk. Um, I sit here on this panel and I, I mean, oh, I'm just in awe on the, the panelists here. And I want to sit with every one of you and sit for hours and hours and hours and hours, drink tea, and I'll make, the, make some bannock and I want to listen to your stories as well. That's where we have to do. That's what we need to do. So um, um, for non-Indigenous, non-First Nation people, I th think that's what we got to do. We just got to have to sit and talk. Um, we have to learn each other's culture, our rights. We have to understand each other. And again, we talk about the seven grandfather teachings. We have to, we have to learn that and apply that to our life. Um, so I'm going to just say, we just got to listen. We got to open our ears. We just got to have sit down, have some bannock and tea and just listen to one another. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much for that uh, reminder of listening and reclaiming, reclaiming so many things, language, um, culture, reminding us of films. Wonderful. Thank you, Ed. Uh, next, we're going to hear from, um, from Ruva. Uh, so same question around youth. Um, the question around youth is what is the impact of resistance on youth in the community? Um, and I'll offer you the follow-up question now. I could repeat it again later, but the follow-up question, I mean, you talked a little bit about um, uh, challenging scarcity and working from abundance, the reminder that there's enough for all. Um, practically, how do you go about that? And, and what would you say to other people who may want to do something similar? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think around youth, um, very much like Patrick said, I'm often in awe of the youth, even though I, I do still consider myself one of them. Um, <laughs> and um, but even especially those younger than me um, to see how far they've been able to take their activism at, at very young ages. But I think often having to remember um, that that was the way that was paved for them um, by, you know, folks that are a little bit older and folks that are way older. And that's the same thing that will, you know, happen for them. Um, so I think that for me, that's the impact on youth is seeing somebody else do it or, you know, fight for something um, emboldens them to fight for even more. Um, and that's something that I've been very, very glad to see in many communities, but I think especially in um, my home community up in Sudbury, because um, growing up there, it was very, very isolating to be Black, but not only that, but it was something that wasn't talked about, or I felt like understood amongst my peers, even like adults in schools and things, and um, seeing even kids now that are maybe 10 years younger than me, uh, how different it is for them. Um, obviously, there's still challenges, but um, kids, they've seen, they're a lot more vocal about talking about things like racism as they experience them and I think that's been huge um, is that the the resistance has even just opened those conversations because I think a lot of people forget that um, with 
issues like racism, obviously there are the the visible systemic effects, but the interpersonal and personal effects of systems like racism, you know, like if you have, you know, different conversations or interactions where racism is present, but you can't talk about them, you know, oftentimes young people will internalize those things and say, well, it's my fault this is happening because they don't know or aren't allowed to talk about the larger implications of racism but now that youth are allowed to talk about those things they can see like oh no no this this wasn't my fault it was like this person has you know racist ideas or this system is built in a way that's not built for me um and i've just been so heartened and so full, like full of joy at being able to see young people understand those things in a way that's very liberating for them that helps them understand who they are and how the world works and it's also a little bit saddening because when you see younger and younger people really understanding racism um, and having to you know spend a lot of their time and energy fighting it but it, yeah it's also i think very hopeful for me the way it's affected other youth but also me as a youth because i feel i have also very much benefited from those who came before me um and able to bring my kind of youthful energy into uh into the the activism and the resistance work that i do um and the way it joins together generations you know as elders bring the wisdom and youth bring that energy i think that's something that also youth really uh benefit from when it comes to resistance uh Oh, and the second part of that question about um, not work, working from abundance, um, it's a practice. I will absolutely say that. I think um, it's one of those things that we all want to come very quickly. And um, for me still, um, I think that acknowledging that because we live within these settler colonial systems, you know, that idea of scarcity is often going to be the first thought. And that's OK um, to sit with that but then to challenge that thought, that first thought of, oh, we don't have enough. Um, and then looking into how can we, the, then you can look into how you can be more expansive with your resources. Um, and there's, kind, there's some kind of institutional steps that can be taken in terms of, you know, from my kind of experience in nonprofits, you know, turning to your board and saying, either, you know, because I think a lot of time you're being asked to do more with less and just be like, we have to do less with less, you know, <laughs> be like, we, these are, you know, even limiting the amount you do sometimes doesn't feel like that doesn't feel like it's intuitively sometimes that it's working for abundance, but it is because then you can hone the things that you really do and the things that you're really good at, but also looking at, you know, the way philanthropy and grants work and um, changing our attitude towards the competition around things like grants of being like, what if we work together, you know, because it's, I've always found it a little bit wild that all these organizations working together end up competing for money instead of being like, okay, so, you know, this grant is best for you and we can help you with this application and this grant is best for us. And the more we can work in solidarity rather than this competition that's part of it, I think is really, it really helps with that mindset of abundance. And, and I think the last part of that is letting things take the time they take because I think we are so inundated with um, with deadlines and they become so cemented in us that we forget sometimes that nobody's gonna die if we don't make that deadline, you know? And sometimes we do have to slow down and say, okay, is this, is this project or is this activism that we're doing necessary right now or would taking some extra time on it actually give us the resources that we need to make it more fulsome, make it more liberatory, make it more impactful. So just kind of, and I, th I know those things are hard because they're often institutionally placed, but I think the more people who are able to stand up and say, actually, this deadline is unrealistic, um, <laughs> is, is one of those things that can really help us or, you know, like, how can we reshare out this money or how can we retry this you know because also with scarcity we're often end up keeping things that we don't need to keep all the time because we might need it later um and if we can work from a, a kind of more mutual aid mindset of 
you know, if we have extra now, we can give it. And then when we need extra, we can trust that those in solidarity with us will be there to give us what we need. Um, it's a very difficult exercise, especially institutionally, but I think those things can be really, really impactful. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much, uh, Ruva, for sharing uh, how this practice and uh, working from abundance. Um, we'll now hear from um, Rachel. Uh, so responding to that same question around what is the impact of resistance on youth in the community? Uh, and then, uh, Rachel, a follow-up question for you. Um, you had talked about decolonizing the mind, um, as well as documenting oral history, museums, and so on. In terms of decolonizing the mind, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that a bit more. Um, what would you say to people around um, how to go about that? Uh, what does that process look like for you? So again, the two questions are, um, what is what is the impact of resistance on youth um, in the community? Screen and then breaking, so I didn't get. Okay, so sorry. The first question is, what is the impact of resist of um, resistance on youth in the community? And I, I know you wrote something in the chat, but I wonder if you might speak to that. Uh, and the second question was around um, calling the mind. So you had spoken about that earlier. So um, what would you name for people in terms of uh, either how you go about decolonizing the mind or what you would um, share for others about how they might go about that. Uh, <laughs> internet challenges, but she has written a bit in the chat in terms of, of youth, youth resistance, so I wonder if I might share that. Uh, and as she comes back, we'll invite her to share a little bit more about decolonizing the mind. Um, so her perspectives, she's written four points. One um, is love for your own land and your own people. Uh, two is self-love. Three is development and the realization that we all have solutions to make things better for us. And four, it promotes the spirit of Ubuntu, uh, I am because you are. So we thank Rachel for those words and uh, we hope we will be able to hear from her um, again a bit later. Uh, now we're going to hear once again from Davisha, who's going to offer a poem for us. And just as a reminder, um, uh, anyone's welcome to add some questions to the chat. Uh, some questions have been added so far. We'll respond to those shortly. Uh, but in, uh, for now, we'll hear from uh, Davisha, who's going to offer us a poem. So welcome back, Davisha. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share two short pieces with you. And the first poem that I will share with you has not been written by me, uh, but has rather been submitted by an 85 year old Caribbean Canadian who has a passion for sharing um, her community experience. And her name is Doreen. And so um, I will share her poem that is called Still Standing. We know for sure that it started in the 15th century. And now we are here and still standing. They came for us and popped us into the bellies of their sailing boats, auctioned us off at their devilish markets. Despite that, we are still standing. Made us hungry so that we begged for bread, kidnapped our freedom just to make themselves feel good. Despite that, we are still standing. We knew better. We knew that this was not the creator's plan. We knew there was a time for correction and so, we are still standing. Did the Bible say sin was black? Did the Bible say good and God were white? Who cultivated these terrible assumptions? Was this a conspiracy made on the top decks of those ships? Perhaps so. But with God's help, we are still standing. I want to thank Doreen for sharing that. I am um, so humbled to, to share that on her behalf. And now I will jump into my, my last piece to share with you guys in this I call pride. My black is not what I am, it is who I am. My black skin is not just one thing, it's my beauty, my excellence, quick lipped, difficult to anger, heart of a fighter, skin soft as a lover. My black is every tongue lashing, acne scar, self harm coming out still glowing. My brown skin is all I've endured, forever hidden, wounds scabbing over but never healing, dried red fading into brown as it becomes a part of me, my flesh stunk of death until God breathed, God's breath does life into me, Devisha. She and I intertwine, no matter what she does, we remind that it is her brown skin, not just her mind. When brown was the least favorite color, while pink flooded daggering brightness, my brown was my protector and I survived. 
not in spite of, because of, we bathed in sun, stand out in seas, my brown skin carries the weight of a life I'll never lead, memories I wish to never have, prayers that kept me alive, ancestors who always had to fight so I can rest. So I roll my shoulders and do what's necessary so in peace they rest, knowing all of this told me to hide. But when I see her wrapped delicately in brown skin, all I can feel is pride. Thank you. Thank you, Devisha, for both sharing the poem from Doreen Crick and also sharing your own, uh, your own poetry. Uh, again, very powerful. So thank you once again. Um, friends, we're going to transition to the last uh, question uh, for the panelists. And this question is looking forward. Um, so this is around imagining the future and working together. So the question for our panelists are, what do you dream of seeing in the future? in terms of the elimination of anti-Black racism, of decolonization and relationship to the land? And what steps might we take as a movement to get there? What are some innovative ways that we might continue this work in our day-to-day -day work and in our lives? So looking forward, uh, those are the questions for the panelists. And uh, this time we will start with Patrick, please. Thank you, thank you. What do I dream of? Uh, looking forward, I think things are changing now, of course. Uh, Black people have been given a chance to sit at the table. I mean, a uh, small tabouret, you know, part of the big table, but we are getting there. And um, it is a good start, but uh, we still have a long way to go. Um, so what I dream of is the next generation. I guess it's going to go back to all my three answers here. This is about our history, our culture pres preserving our story telling our stories being proud in it so i just want the next generation to be enrich and grow their black canadian uh if we're going to talk from canada point of view their black canadian um narrative um i just encourage you know young black canadians to to be proud of their history so that's what i want to see i want to see us being proud of our history to look at places such as like uh you know nova scotia to look at places such as from an interpreter point of view uh there's a, there's a place called uh, sheffield park black history museum which is uh it's a living history of the first uh, uh black settlers in ontario you know specifically in the Co collingwood uh owen sound area and that was uh like the, one of the two uh northern terminals for the the underground uh railroad system so places like i want black people in the future to just be proud of it the next generation to unapologetically tell those stories to tell the world that we've been part of this country since uh Mathieu da costa arrived here in 1604 you know as the first black slave or black person in canada you know i just dream of days where black canadians will no longer be written off uh history books you know um i went to high school in hamilton ontario and it, it's so sad to say that i find out about uh Harriet tubman being in st catherine's for anybody that knows the distance between hamilton and st catherine is about 45 minutes maybe 30 minute drive probably even less than that um i find that in my 30s you know when i went to high school in hamilton it was never taught but i found out in my 30s through just reading an article one day finding out that there's um Harriet tubman school in st catherine so i called my cousin i'm like hey you went to st catherine did you know about this she's like no i didn't we need to educate ourselves so i dream in the future that black canadians would no longer be written off the history books uh because we shaped this country you know? um and our stories and narratives should reflect that so that's 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 my uh my 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 pipe dreams if you want to put it that way that's how i dream if 20 years down the road my i have twin daughters who are 12 years old you know, when they do these, I want them to absolutely know the importance of Black people in Canada. And because this is their Canada, you know, they don't know anything else. This is their Canada. This is our Canada. For the majority of us, we've lived here or we we're born here longer than anywhere else. So we need to take to take ownership of that. Um, my daughter, again, who's 12 years old, one of them, uh, just last week or two weeks ago, somebody said, uh, but the, where are you guys from? Where are you people from? And then she said, but I'm from Ottawa. 
right? And again, they're 12 years old that they were trying, the person was trying to make it so she was Congolese or her parents were Congolese or, or whatever. But I'm like, no, you need to take ownership of you as a Black Canadian. This is who you are. So the future is for Black Canadians to not be um, written off of history, to not be shy to say that we shape this country, to not be shy to say that, yes, my ancestors built this country as well. So that's, that's what I hope to see in the future. Great, thank you for sharing your dreams, Patrick, uh, both for yourself and for your children. Um, very appreciated. Uh, we'll hear next from Ruva. Um, Ruva, can you tell us a bit about some of your dreams? What do you dream about seeing in the future on elimination of anti-Black racism and more? So what is one of your dreams? Yes, um, it's funny because I feel like they, my dreams are, are feel so simple, but also uh, at times unachievable um, because my dreams are for, you know, for Black people to have what they need, you know, to spiritually, like mentally, physically, financially have what they need so they can thrive. Um, because I feel like so many of us, like so many marginalized people um, in Canada and across the world uh, are constantly just trying to survive um, in so many ways, even when we have what you need materially, you know, like mentally, emotionally, spiritually, often still just trying to survive. So though that's my my dream, you know, is for people black people to have not only, you know, a, a, a sense of history, but also future here. Um, and, and I think for me, those dreams are also so intertwined um, with the fates of all different marginalized people people in Canada. You know, I, I, I dream of, of uh, a time in the future where, you know, like land is rematriated back to indigenous peoples. And because I feel like those, especially with indigenous peoples, like our, our fates um, for a, a liberated future are so, tied together um, as they have been in the history of Canada. So that is a big part of my dream for Black people in Canada. And I, you know, I dream for freedom of movement, you know, so that I can I can see my relatives in Zimbabwe and they can come see me and we can live these lives that are that are more intertwined and that, you know, that aren't your family isn't defined by immigration status and visa status you know i dream for regularization of status for migrants so people can move more freely you know and and i dream of an anti-carceral world where people have what they need so they are not disproportionately in jail or having you know getting conflicts and being you know, injured or murdered by police. Um, and these dreams all seem, I think a lot of the time for me, like a pipe dream, but they're really very much, you know, a, a basic idea of people being able to live and live out dreams and, and you know, do the professions they wanna do and make art and, and music, you know, like I, I dream of going to the yarn store without being stared at. <laughs> it's all of these things are so, intertwined you know it's like really breaking down those you know our economic and like government institutions that still enshrine inequality because that's you know the end of it is a lot of these systems don't work if there's not inequality so it kind of it builds you know it goes all the way to the top um but <laughs> so yeah i guess in make a long story short those are my dreams <laughs> Thank you, Rufa, for sharing uh, some of your dreams. Uh, we'll go next to hear from Ed uh, and some of Ed's dreams. So Ed, what do you dream about uh, seeing in the future in terms of the elimination of anti-Black racism, of decolonization in relationship to the land? And how do we begin to get there? What steps do we take? And how can we continue this work in our day-to-day -day work lives, uh, work and lives? So, mm -hmm. I guess all I can say is ditto. <laughs> it, uh, it amazes me uh, how our, our cultures are twined like that. Um, but if I have to add to it, um, I dream about a, a time when I'm not petrified when my 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 25 year old daughter is walking down the street. Um, I don't know if people heard about the Charlie Hitch incident that happened here in Thunder Bay years ago, but I I. I 
shiver when my daughter's walking down the street. Um, I dream of a time when um, I could, again, you know, I can go to the dollar store without being followed around. The dollar store being followed around because of color of my skin as well, right? Um, I, you know, it's crazy. I dream about a time where I don't have to do this. I don't have to sit in my office and talk about Aboriginal culture and the right way and the wrong way to um, treat people and treat Aboriginal, treat, even treat Black people, right? I want to be out of my job. I want to work my way out of this job. That's what I dream about. I dream about where, you know, my son, um, he has a chance to, to show that he is the right person for that job not because of the color of his skin or where he's from or if he's the chief's cousin or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I want that dream to be that he is a hard worker. You know, um, I, I dream about that, that the community, the, our youth in our community, um, they're having a hard time in all communities. Uh, and it's sad, but um, sometimes drugs and alcohol are the only uh, solution. I dream about a time where there they're able to talk and able to speak to, I don't care if it's a, an Aboriginal elder or, or a priest or whoever, that they could actually come to somebody and say, here's my problems, here's where I'm feeling hurt. That's my dreams. And again, my dreams are to grow some hair as well, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Thank you for sharing your dreams. So we've heard dreams from, from Ed and from Ruva and from Patrick. And um, Rachel also has dreams. Rachel um, is having internet challenges and is not able to speak to them, but has written them into the chat. So I wonder if I might offer what she has written. So Rachel shares that her dreams are um, number one, for any change to happen, for any change to happen and be sustainable, it should be structural and institutionalized, that decolonization must pay attention to the education system by teaching the truth about African history and technologies that existed way before colonization. Number two, that oral traditions and wisdom of African people must be documented and disseminated. And number three, that we also need to utilize our own resources in order to stop depending on tide aid. So thank you, Rachel, for those thoughts and insights. Um, so with that, uh, we are now going to shift to um, any questions that some of you may have. And uh, some of you have been writing in the chat uh, throughout this conversation. So we will offer these back to the panelists to explore. And if there are additional questions that you would like, uh, please continue to add them into the chat. So the first question is actually uh, just specifically for Ruva, and then the rest will be for everyone. Um, so the first question for you, Ruva, is, um, is there a website or more information on programs uh, that you mentioned? So things like the Virtual Black uh, History Month Museum and the festival. So Ruva, if you're able to respond to that one, please. Yes. Um, yes, so blmsudbury.ca, um, and I can put that in the chat too, uh, is the website for Black Lives Matter Sudbury. Um, and there you can find all the information, including um, Black Futures Month, uh, which is the theme of this year's kind of uh, activities for Black History Month um, starting on later this week, February 24th. Um, so you can sign up this year, it will be hybrid. So if you're in the area, there'll be some in-person events too, but there will be online panels and educational events. In addition to that, the past year's um, panels and educational events where you might see somebody on the screen um, uh, are also available on the website. And there's also a link to the Museum of Black History, um, which is just wonderful. I'm so in awe of all the people who worked on that. Uh, but yes, blmsudbury.ca has all that information. And they're also on Instagram and Facebook as well as BLM Sudbury, where you can find more of that work. Thank you, Riva. So uh, a website where people can go for more information. So we've heard that. So that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, the next uh, one is for everybody. Uh, this is more of a comment, but wondering if you might respond to the comment um, by uh, adding additional insights. So the comment in the chat is uh, noting that Canada's economy today exploits African mineral resources through its role in mining. And the Toronto Stock Exchange has several Canada-based mining companies 
that enrich themselves and their investors by exploiting African resources. So I wondered if any of you wanted to comment on that. I'll, I'll take it on. Uh, I don't know what the question exactly is, but I do know that Canada has been one of the, the countries, sorry to use this word, that's been uh, raping the Congo and pillaging the Congo's uh, minerals. And it's funny because uh, uh, on one hand, uh, we always look at the colonizers as Britain and France, and we forget Canada. And um, I don't think I have a I, I have a solution for it or anything like this, but um, there's I, we as Congolese people are actually tired of that. We're tired of knocking on. The, I've been on the hill for the past, and I'm not even exaggerating. I think for the past almost twenty years, where we've had marches and and whatnot, sit-ins, and when Harper was still pre, uh, prime minister to now and we're not being heard our voices are not being heard because of course it's bringing a lot of money to canada um i remember i think uh, with the carlton for example canada this is a couple of years ago about 2015 or so canada made about four billion dollars in mining um in one year from the congo alone um We've tried telling the government, but again, they don't care because, of course, it's uh, it's Africans, and our voices are not that that big. And I think um, in the future, it's, it it takes people like myself, who are Canadian Congolese, right, who can stand in front of my peer Canadians and say, "Hey, stop doing this to my other people in the Congo." But even then, they're not listening. So I, again, I don't remember what the question was, but I just wanted to bring it up just because I know that. Um, Mining, Canadian mining corporations in the Congo are absolutely destroying the Congolese people. And you talk about blood diamonds, while well, Canada has a lot of uh, blood on uh, on the Congolese minerals. And I think it's about time we as Canadians start denouncing our government for it. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I'll keep adding more questions. And oh, sorry, Ruva, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. So, because I, I wanted to add a little bit on to this, because I think uh, this is one of those things where education is is so important. Because, like Patrick has says, I think these are things that often Canadians um, don't know about and are very important for a lot of conversations we're having, including when people talk about, you know people coming to Canada either as immigrants or as refugees and people ask you know why does Canada need to help these people and it's because well oftentimes the the very um circumstances that they are escaping or leaving are caused by you know the the uh, the what's it called the fallout from um, Canadian mining operations, you know, and we talk about these that, you know, are also tied into climate um, in Canada and climate action because um, the countries that are very much facing the, uh, the, the consequences of climate change are the ones that are doing the least and then countries like Canada who are, you know, contributing in an outsized way are the ones who are most able to mitigate the effects. And so I think uh, centralizing these conversations is important, especially during something like Black History Month, because people often won't see the connections between Black History Month and things like climate or mining. Um, but these things are very much specifically intertwined and how that kind of environmental racism ties into environmental racism here in Canada um, and how it ties into different struggles, you know, environmental of indigenous land claims here in Canada, because some a lot of the times it's if not those same mining companies who are, you know, uh, violating indigenous rights in Canada that are violating, you know, rights in Africa, but or companies that are very closely tied together. And I think these things both um, are sometimes saddening to hear how big and complex these systems are, but also it gives us a chance to understand why it's so important that um, all of our different um, all of our different sectors are working together on these issues as big as they may be. 
Thank you, Ruva. And uh, in the chat, there's now a, a link um, to uh, that uh, part of the Kairos website that talks about environmental racism and making corporations accountable. So uh, we can explore those, uh, explore that further. Um, it further deepens the conversation that we are having at the moment. Uh, so again, the next question is for anyone who would like to respond. And this question is, how do you think that social media or technology in general, for that matter, has helped or hindered the advancement of your culture or race um, when it comes to anti-racism. So that's for anyone who would like to respond. Yes, please, Ed. Um, first, I guess uh, one is uh, we've all heard it now. The O Canada that was that was sung just uh, days ago um, that they tweaked the. Uh, <laughs> The song, which in a positive way, um, I think uh, um, social media has really helped that message to come out. It helped uh, First Nation people, for example, with 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 uh, um, the finding of residential school um, buried children. Um, but looking at another way, we have these these you know, keyboard warriors that are going out and recording that drunk Indian. And, and this is how we are, and this is our, this, this thieving Indian, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's the same as, you know, I, I watch it on social media, it's same with black people, they, they record, you know, the negativity, and, and that's what kind of sticks in everybody's mind. Sadly, the positive things that our cultures and our people put out there, are kind of pushed off to the side and yeah okay and we did that one big deal you, you know what I mean? so, so so social media could be a positive and a negative thank you okay thank you ed uh river or patrick would you like to respond to this question um i think for for me it was we definitely saw the impact um, especially during 2020 and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it's so unfortunate because things like, well, if, you know, the, the, the video um, of, of police killings hadn't been circulated through social media, um, I don't know if there would have been that much of an impact or a movement through these types of things. And so I think when we are, when we are given more space and um, ways to connect, you know, across, you know, countries and borders, um, across provinces in the country, uh, we are able to better organize, we are able to better understand what's going on and uh, to prove what's going on because things like police brutality people have been talking about for decades and decades, you know, and until people were able to see the videos. Um, a lot of the time, unfortunately, we weren't believed or people weren't caring, uh, but social media has really allowed voices to to be amplified. And yeah, like Ed said, I think it has also allowed a lot of hate to be amplified, unfortunately, and it's allowed a lot of people to organize, you know, against things like anti-racism. But I think overall, um, because of the, it allows us to connect. I think that is really what about social media has furthered these movements, especially through, you know, the pandemic and allowed people to connect even when we couldn't connect physically. I think for me, uh, social media, uh, what it's allowed to do, I'm old enough to remember, for example, Rodney King. Not that I was old enough to understand how what was going on, but I'm old enough. I was 12 years old or something when that happened. Uh, but that was just one camera and probably in America, in California, and the riot that happened in LA, right? For those that were old enough to remember, what 2020 did for me personally uh and just to give a little background of my uh my childhood i grew up in uh in south africa even though i said i'm congolese i was born in the congo but uh i'm actually a Mzanzi boy so a south african so river i mean river i said that just for you actually since i since you zimbabwean um so i did see nelson mandela coming out of prison for example and i saw the the whole movement 
and the fight and uh, the, the the whole liberation movement that was happening at the time. And I'd never felt that again until the summer of 2020. And at this point, it's uh, this was like 30 years later, and I just I felt a movement where I could see, for example, John Boyega in London crying his eyes, eyes out and me realizing that, not me realizing that I knew that, but I just knew that, you know what, Black Brits are also going through the same thing. You know, and then you see the um, the, the, the French um, uh, banlieues or um, suburbs and what the French people would, were doing, burning cars and stuff like this is because, you know, the French and the Arab kids, I'm like, oh my God, this is a collective thing, right? The Americans and then Canadians also started speaking out saying, Oh my God, we're hurting too. We're hurting. And that was social media showing us that we are all in this collective thing, which is against um uh, against uh racism and racism for 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 all of us. And there was such a uh, there was such a unity that came within um marginalized people. Uh, you know, I I I still have goosebumps actually uh here in Ottawa went down for the march. And there was um, somebody who had uh, a thing saying, protect black and indigenous women, right? And it was like, and it, and it felt like we gave us a voice, it gave us a voice to talk. So I will, I will talk about the good thing about social media in that aspect that it did give us a voice to, to feel that we are not, we're not crazy. You know, we're not, excuse to use the word, but we're not just talking out of, whatever we are actually this is our realities where there's in uh, some of us even you know um lost i mean um left workplaces and stuff like that because you know it it became to a point where we were we realized that microaggression that was not only happening in our workplaces but it was happening at the stores was happening at our soccer games was happening at the airports was happening all over the western world and uh, all that, I think it's due to uh, social media for making us realize that we are not alone, right? And going back to Patrice Mumba, he did uh, say that one line, we are not alone. You know, uh, people from all those marginalized places feel the same pain that we do. And that was the beauty of social media. Now, of course, social media also does have its... Uh, its um, a bad aspect of it and uh, like the misinformation and stuff like that but i think in terms of fighting for for you know for our blackness or for our rights and stuff like that social media was a very very good tool especially in the summer of 2020 when we all collectively realized that we we're hurting amazing thank you patrick ruva and ed um, we are nearing the end of our time together, and you have shared so many insights so far. I just wondered if each of you might want to offer a last word, um, last last sentence, challenge, encouragement, anything along those lines. So kind of your last send out, what would you like to say to people? And we can go in any order. Yes, Riva, please. Okay, um, I know today uh, for many of us is the first day of Lent. Um, and I think I would encourage uh, us to, I know it's almost the end of February, but extend your Black History Month. Um, <laughs> maybe, you know, learn event events, but, you know, try and now throughout this Lent, you know, keeping that spirit maybe of anti-racism and learning throughout the next 40 days, extend your Black History Month. Uh, I'll, I'll say, um, going back to, as you can tell, I'm always, I'm all about quoting Patrice Lumumba today. So I'll quote Patrice Lumumba again, and I'll do this in French, so I hope the translator, the interpreters can actually get this for the English speakers. Um, Entre la liberté et l'esclavage, il n'y a pas de compromis. And uh, basically, there is no compromise between we are on our liberty and our freedom and our freedom on everything about us. We should never compromise. We should be proud Black people, we should be proud Indigenous people, we should be proud whoever we are, and we should never, ever, ever uh, just forget that about who we are. So, entre la liberté et l'esclavage, 
il n'y a pas de compromis. There should be no compromising for that. So that's the last thing I'll say. I'll say that uh, I have I've I've learned a lot of stuff here. Uh, I'm embarrassed to uh, say that 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 uh, the Black history of Canada um, is basically like the Black or the, the Aboriginal history of Canada. Um, it amazes me that our cultures, and I said this earlier, it amazes me that our cultures are so um, we're both you know going down the same path. They went down the same path. Um, and I'm glad that we are sitting here today and we're talking about our cultures, talking about our rights, we're talking about our freedoms, we're talking about, you know, who we are and what we can do as a society. Um, I just have to say, uh, miigwech, thank you very much for allowing me to sit here, allow me to be part of your Black History uh, event here that, that, you know, even though I'm Aboriginal and Anishinaabe, that, uh, um, that it's it, we're trying to celebrate the history of Black culture and Black people in Canada. What we're talking around the world that I'm allowed to sit here and, and just listen to amazing stories. So I just want to say, you know, miigwech, thank you very much for that. For, for that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Rachel, uh, Ruha, Ed. Patrick for your insights. It's been uh, it's been a really rich conversational time. Um, in a moment, we're going to turn it back over to um, Radia to uh, share some announcements but, um, about Black History Month or Black-led organization that you would like to share with everybody. Um, please feel free to add that into the chat. I, I see some people are adding that already. There's some suggestions for children's books, websites, and different ideas. So please continue to add that into the chat before we go. And these will be, uh, people can, you can take these away as resources. So please feel free to add into the chat uh, anything that you think would be helpful for the good as a whole. So thank you once again to our panelists. Um, we're not quite done. We're going over to Radia now for um, some closing announcements. And thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Adele. And uh, once again, thank you for uh, the panelists. This was really a very rich, powerful, um, and really beautiful discussion. So I'm very humbled and, and grateful to have been able to hear your stories and your experiences. Um, I also want to um, thank Davisha and Doreen for sharing um, so beautiful and powerful uh, words. Honestly, it was very, very emotional. Um, and we want to let you know that we have an art showcase right now that is um, our way to celebrate the culture and accomplishments of the Black and communities and its allies. Um, so we invite youth around the world to um, create artwork, uh, visual arts, performing arts, uh, musical pieces, or even written art along the themes of Black pride and, and Black um, joy and allyship and solidarity and resistance. Um, and please um, upload that and share that with us. Um, we'll be very happy to um, share that um, throughout the month during our Black History Month um, video also that we're preparing. So I'm putting the link um, here in the chat. Um, we're going to ask you to please share that link and uh, encourage people to please um, participate in this, um, in this art showcase. Um, a few other advocacy pieces that we want to share with you. So Carol's has been conducting a letter writing campaign uh, to help get Bill um, C226 on environmental racism, along with two um, corporate accountability bills passed. Um, so we need to keep up the pressure and we ask that you please write to your MPs today to support um, these bills. I'm also putting the link here in chat. Um, and then finally, um, we would also ask you to help support grassroots women organizations by joining us um, in urging the Canadian government to increase its international assistance envelope and uh, here again the link is in the chat so feel free to check out those links um, send those emails and share with your networks um, so yeah as um, we mentioned we want to give uh, maybe the opportunity for some people who want to share anything or some black led organization if there's anything um, that you want to share feel free to raise your hand um, and we'll give you a few minutes to share a bit. Um, if not, then we'll pass it on to Barbara. 
Hello, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thank you, uh, Radia. So, uh, yeah, so my name is Barbara Mangwende. I am the Director of Programs at Kairos. I'm honored to do this last part of the agenda, um, just the closing remarks and, uh, and thank yous. Uh, what an inspiring event uh, this afternoon, uh, marking Black History Month, hosted by Kairos, our first ever um, event. So we've heard from uh, different voices on this panel uh, who are Black activists in their communities, uh, people of Afro descent and from the diaspora, how they have expressed and celebrated resistance in the past, present, and what it means uh, for the future. We've also heard what anti-colonial ways of resistance exist and how they can be utilized and expanded upon to advance the work globally of anti-Black racism. I'm hoping you found this event um, inspiring, educational, informative, and perhaps instilling pride in you, uh, which is really my key takeaway. I, I'm, I'm feeling more proudful to be a Black person of African descent uh, living in, in Canada. The celebrations will continue as we feature in art showcase with the goal of showcasing the culture and accomplishments of the Black community and its allies, as alluded by, uh, by Radia already. But I wanted to take the opportunity to um, say congratulations and, and well done uh, to everybody. Uh, this was a, a remarkable um, event. And also, I would like to take this time uh, to read a reflection from Aisha Francis, uh, the executive director of Kairos, who couldn't be here with us today. I simply want to acknowledge the work of the Equity Working Group in bringing our inaugural Black History Month event to fruition. While I'm not able to be there to share in the celebration and showcasing of Black brilliance and voice towards efforts and action of resistance, I'm invested in this moment and see it as a Kairos moment. The work we do at Kairos is through solidarity relationships with many people, uh, partners, and communities here in Canada and globally. Kairos is committed to advancing our work of activism and resistance in the areas of migrant justice, ecological justice, gender rights, and indigenous rights. We step into this opportune moment to teach, to learn, to celebrate, and to be in solidarity with Black voices of resistance. So, Thank you, Aisha. Uh, that was her reflection uh, for this event. So behind every successful event, there is a great team. I would like to take the opportunity on behalf of Kairos to say thank you and show our appreciation to, uh, first of all, the event funder, that's Canadian Race Relations Foundation, whose financial support uh, made this event possible. The panel members who said yes uh, to the invitation uh, to this uh, plenary session, uh, that was themed um, uh, Voices of Resistance, a celebration of Black history and imagining futures, uh, just for a, a very engaging and, and inspiring uh, session. So firstly, there's uh, Adele Halliday, uh, United Church of Canada, Anti-Racism and Equity Lead. Rachelle Chuan, uh, South Sudan Council of Churches, uh, Black Lives Matter um, 
and Ruva Guequerere, uh, Citizens for Public Justice intern, then Ed Collins, uh, Fort William First Nation, Patrick Cabea, uh, documentary film producer, then Davisha Francis for this um, in spoken word artist. And also the participants of the art showcase from around the world who have submitted and are still submitting various artworks, including visual arts, uh, performing arts, musical pieces, written art along the themes of Black pride and joy, allyship, sorry, solidarity, and resistance. Last but not least, um, just appreciating everyone who has participated in this uh, inspiring events today, including Cairo staff, partners, volunteers, supporters. Um, and without your participation, this event would not have been as enriching and as successful as it has been. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day and um, happy rest of uh, Black History Month. Thank you so much.